Our next session is titled The Long and Short of Bad Credit and Bad Credit Analysis. Uh, I can see some faces. I think he's also going to talk about impact on equities. So, so it's a long and short of bad credit and bad credit analysis and impact on equities. Uh, this session will be moderated by Satish Bitatpur, CFA. A few words about Satish. Satish is Managing Director, Head of Investments, uh, India at State Street Global Advisors. Uh, some of you who don't know about State Street Global Advisors, they have $3 trillion asset under management and $33 trillion asset under custody, the third largest asset manager in the world. Shatish has over 25 years of investment industry experience working in the United States and India. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Satish Betatpur over to the stage. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's a tough session post-lunch. Good time to take a power nap. But unfortunately, we have Joel Littman here, who will keep you all awake and entertained and educated for the next one hour. Um, Joel is, um, runs a research firm called Valence Research and also a financial publishing company called Altimet Metric. Um, he's a prolific writer in Seeking Alpha. He's also written, on, written with the um, Harvard Business Review. Um, so he's an expert on credit. And credit is very topical in India right now. We've had many instances of issues with bad credit ratings, uh, issues with companies going belly up. Um, so I would welcome Joel to come on and give us an exciting hour of um, discussions on credit. Come on. Thank you, sir. Oh, no, this boring presentation on credit just after lunch, how, how worse could it get? Um, and I'm going to start with this very old picture. Is anyone familiar with this picture? This is the greatest class reunion in the history of finance, the greatest. And in this, this one picture, you actually have, anyone recognize this guy? Let me stand here. That's Warren Buffett. 12% alpha per year for over 40 years. That's Buffett back in the day. Um, but let's see, who else is in this picture? Can you recognize that smile? Charlie Munger, right? Vice Chairman of Berkshire Hathaway now. People don't realize that prior to Berkshire Hathaway, Charlie did 15 plus years of generating alpha 15% above the market for 15 years straight. I mean, he crushed it. That was before he joined Buffett. So he was already a great investor prior. Um, Tom Knapp and Anderson, Tweedy Brown, which is still around today, um, running, I don't know, tens of billions of assets. And they've got, uh, they had 13% alpha. They beat the market by 13% in the first 15 to 20 years. Um, this is one picture. And we're talking about equities, right? I know it's a credit presentation, but we're talking about equities. Uh, Walter Schloss, that was his alpha, six and a half times the market. It's at 650% times the market over the course of uh, 40 years. Who else? I'm still going. It's the same picture. It's the same picture. This is Bill Ruane of Sequoia. What did he do? Uh, that's before he passed away in 2000, I don't know, early 2000s. Right? Again, massive alpha. So you find all these great investors, and they all, right? Sandy Gotsman, First Manhattan, his net worth is over three and a half billion. And this class, all were there for the professor. Who's the professor? It's the CF Institute, yes? It was Ben Graham, of course, the father of the CF Institute. He taught security analysis for 20-something years. And he created, with a bunch of other people, the CFA proposal, which created the NYSSA, or the CFA Society of New York. And he published what is arguably the two greatest books in investing, according to the greatest investors. One, Intelligent Investor. And two, Security Analysis. In which, and here's where we get to credit, in which the terms debt and credit appear over 400 times, 
400 times in just these two editions. Right? So clearly, there's got to be some connection between credit and equity that is not boring, but actually makes sense, given that we're talking about the greatest alpha investors in history. So this is one great investor who looked at this period of time and said, uh, I'm looking at this uh, 04, 05 period. Stock market's doing very well. And he said, you know what? There's nothing new on Wall Street. Nothing. He said, be there can't be because there's speculation. Right? Whatever happens today has happened before, and it's going to happen again. All right? So when he's looking at 04, 05, this great, great investor, he said, I'm looking at this, and I see that as this happens, this is equities, this is the stock market, credit is very, very important to this going on. And he said, if I look at the headlines, this is actual newspaper headlines. I said newspaper headlines. 07, New York bond offering fails. October, financial contagion spreads. Interest rates soar. Major brokerage nearly collapses. You familiar with this? You guys remember this? Did you, anyone remember this? Mm -hmm. Oh, you're lying. You're lying. Nobody remembered seeing this. You know why? Because this wasn't, this is Jesse Livermore. He was referring, when he talked about this, the association of credit and equity, to the market panic of 1907, 101 and a half years earlier than whatever you were thinking, right? And these headlines were from June of 07, 1907, and October, financial contagion. Not a new word. Not a new word. This is an issue globally, right? So when he was looking at this in 1907, he said, this has been happening for the last 30, 40, 50, 60 years, back in the 1800s, and it's going to happen again. And you see all these things going on. Although, I'll, I'll say, the uh, major brokerage nearly collapses. The bailout came from J.P. Morgan. J.P. Morgan, the guy, not J.P. Morgan, the firm, right, in terms of the bailout. And that's Livermore. So in 1924, he was talking about the association of credit and equity. Right? He was written up in this great book in 24 right, called Reminiscences of a Stock Market Operator. And he said, hey, everyone, what I just did, I'm going to do again. I'm going to do it again. So I'm going to look at the markets, and I'm going to ask people, can I borrow a million dollars? I'm going to ask the bank, can I borrow a million dollars? And if the response is, no problem, low rates, he says, good. Stock market, 1924 should do very well. And then he goes back again and he says to the banks, uh, can I borrow? They say, again, no problem. He says, that's good. That should continue. He said, it's necessary. And then he says, well, let's see. They tell Livermore, we need collateral. Rates are rising fast. This is an important point, for, especially for right now. Rising rates is not the same thing as high rates. You're way too early if you say rates are rising. I better get out of the market. Recession is coming especially from such low rates. High rates are a problem. Rising rates, no problem. And in fact, even when things get tough, even when, this sounds, this sounds like an emerging market, listen to this. Yes, and we'll loan you a million if you first deposit a million in our bank first. Sounds like <laughs> some parts of the world. Right? At that point, he still said, the equity markets will ignore it. You're too early if you go based on this. He said, you actually have to wait for the markets to get that final peak in, that final rush. And then you'll see a double top. He says that's when you can start to test and realize that this is going to happen all over again. He made 100 million US dollars. In 2020 dollars, that's 1.5 billion that he made. That's one person made a 1.5 billion dollar trading based on that time frame. Because he said, I've noticed that these great things happen to credit and equity together. Um, let's go back past Livermore. How about the Roosevelt recession? These are all equity market collapses. Equity markets falling 30, 40 plus percent. The fall in Nifty 50, that's the US Nifty 50, not, the, not here, right? That's the US. Um, LATAM crisis, 8082, Asia financial crisis. Now, the question is which of these was preceded, preceded, leading indicator by a credit crisis first, a corporate credit crisis, corporate specifically, right? Because we're buying stocks. We're not buying the US government. If you don't like the US government's debt load, that's not exactly the same thing as not liking the corporate debt load. So it's corporate credit we're looking at. And the answer is all of them. All of them have this issue. Even the dot-com bubble in 2000, 
People that were in the debt markets in 99 saw the debt markets caved in. The private placement market globally dried up, dried up completely from the beginning of 99 to the end of 99. You had a good six months to year and a half advance notice that something bad was going to happen, just like Livermore did in 07, just like in 1929, and like we'll have again sometime soon. <laughs> so we look at these two books. This book, about 10 years ago, sold for $25,000, the only Buffett signed copy of Intelligent Investor. It was bought by a mentor of mine named Mitch Julis. Anyone know Mitch Julis, this name? All right, he is a credit and equity investor. He runs, co-runs Canyon Capital, right? Co-runs Canyon Capital. He is known as one of the greatest value investors ever. His name is mentioned with Buffett and Klarman and Howard Marks and Mitch Julis, right? But because he does credit and equity, you don't hear him as much, but he's, he's both sides. And his argument, right? Oh, by the way, that's $300 million he and his partner split. So they're ranked number 25, but if it was one person, it would be in the top 10, right? And I don't think that was his best year. I don't think that was his best year by, by any stretch of the imagination. Anyway, so he contacted me in 99. This is, I've been doing this stuff for a long time, right? In 99, and he said, uh, I want you to speak at this junk bond summit in Las Vegas. And I said, OK. And it was in late 99. He said, we want you to talk about certain things like Amazon. Now, why on earth would we be talking about Amazon in 99? It's because in 98, Amazon issued debt, junk debt, because people said the company had no profits. He said, we want you to speak on it. And I said, um, I got a problem, Mitch. I didn't even know who Mitch was at the time. I said, Mitch, I got a problem. He said, what? I said, I'm an equity guy, right? I'm a financial statement analysis guy. What do I know about credit? And he responded, and this, I remember these words, this is 20 years ago, right? He said, focus on the accounting issues. Talk about why the financial statements are bad for equity or credit or any user, and the credit people will figure out what that means for them. So I did. So we focused on this. And Despite the fact that at the time of this presentation, um, the journal was saying, right, people are aghast at Amazon's price jump. And Amazon posts a loss, but they beat forecasts. So what does that mean? They beat a negative forecast. Um, there's these crazy profit reports that are just confusing investors. Uh, and Moody's has them ranked triple C minus. CAA1, that's triple C minus. What does that mean for Moody's? That means most likely going to go default. Well, if you're going to go bankrupt, that means the equity is worth zero. How could the equity be worth anything? So someone should be paying attention to this. But of course, right, they were using gap numbers. And that was the point of my presentation. Because R&D and non, this is back then, non-cash stock options and leases and excess cash and all kinds of other startup stuff was buried in Amazon's accounting. And on the as-reported numbers, they looked bad. And the point of the presentation was, you can't rely on these as-reported things. It's nonsense. This is back then. This is 20 years ago. And you also can't rely on Moody's, because Moody's is basing their numbers on as-reported earnings and as-reported cash from operations, which is not, by the way. Right? And of course, we know they were wrong. Yes, triple C minus, ridiculous. That, that has been good money for the last 10, 20 years. So PwC, biggest audit, auditor on the planet right, of publicly traded companies, asked me to do a presentation this past year. And guess what they want to talk about? Well, we want to talk about Amazon. Why? Because it's like the headlines haven't changed. Amazon doesn't make profits, but there's no problem. Uh, Amazon never makes money, but nobody cares. WTF, you know what that means. I won't say it. This is live stream. WTF, right? Amazon barely is on a negative PE. So it's, this is crazy. That's what they're arguing. So the stock price has beaten the market for the last 15, 20 years, that's that bottom line. And the as reported, even the operating earnings number, the return on assets that you will find in any database, Bloomberg, FactSet, whatever database around the world, which are all based on the as reported gap numbers, will show this. Now that's their operating number. That's, that's even above the, the net, net loss number. And it still looks like a company that's bad at close to zero. Why would a company with such bad returns have such a phenomenal stock price? And in fact, why would Buffett buy the stock. Is Berkshire Hathaway not owning Amazon? And I talk to people, at Berkshire Hathaway owns Amazon. They're a buyer of Amazon. They're a holder of Amazon. And you say, must be he's, it's, it's not him. It's somebody else coming in that's new. Like, is it? Or is it the fact that Buffett knows the net earnings figure is nonsense? That was the first five minutes of his 
pilgrimage speech. This is, you know, where he gets on stage with Charlie for four or five hours. He said, the net earnings number doesn't represent reality. That was in the first five minutes. He said, before you ask me any questions, I don't want you asking me about this gap. The problem is they reported negative one billion loss first quarter of 2018. Negative one billion. And he said, you know what? In reality, if you look at my railroads, you look at insurance, you look at all the businesses, I really did about five billion in net income, not negative one. And then a year later, don't, don't blink. I don't know if you can tell. The only thing different is their ties. They're red instead of blue, right? And they still show, they're still showing off Coca-Cola. Sponsor, right? Gap rules. This is in the first 10 minutes of a four-hour program. He said, look this up on Yahoo Finance. You'll see this. Gap rules are distorted. The bottom line figures are capricious. They're moody. They jump up and down. And the reason was, you know what he reported for Berkshire for Q1 of 2019? $19 billion in net income, from negative one to positive 19. Now, does stock go like this? Of course not, because he proceeded, to go, he proceeded to go through each division. He said, in reality, last year, first quarter is five. This year, it was about five and a half billion. We're up about 10%. Not the silliness that you see from the gap numbers. It's really a shame, I'm quoting. And then he said this, I guess not everybody studied accounting, <laughs> right? I guess not everybody studied accounting. So, we built this uniform uh, council. The council, we built this with several other people, the top, literally the top accountants on the planet, authors of the GAP guide, authors of the IFRS guide, authors of the state of the CPA, state of accounting profession. And we said, what are the distortions? And let's fix it. And there's 130 of them, from LIFO, FIFO to leases. And by the way, Indian GAP is no exception. Is no exception. It's still as bad as US GAP. Not as bad as IFRS. IFRS is the worst of all of them. Um, and the result is UFRS, it's Uniform Accounting Standards, which people call Uniform Accounting or Uniform Financials. So here's Amazon in reality. Literally off the charts. A return on assets of as high as, this is a $4 billion company generating 40% return. That's 1.6 billion a year. Now, you'd say, haven't the returns fallen? Yes, they've fallen to 15. But the company is now an $85 billion company generating a 15% return. That's $12.5 billion a year in just cash, right? In operating cash flow generation, which they then spend. And under GAAP, it makes it look like it's a bad business. But they're not spending on silly things. They're investing in the future. So you can understand why it's being bought. You can't be a great investor, this is the truism, if you rely on GAAP or IFRS numbers. That means if you rely on PE numbers or earnings per share or whatever, you just can't. And you can't rely on the credit agencies because they're relying on GAAP. And that one, or IFRS, and that one Amazon example over 20 years explains it. But there's others. This is Mitch Julis again. Unless you really understand credit, how can you really be an expert in equity to understand wealth creation? How can you buy Amazon if they're really gonna go bankrupt? Because if they're really going bankrupt, the stock is worth zero, right? right? That's the answer. So he said, you've got to do both. And that's the reason he and his partner make $300 million a year, because they're doing it and everyone else isn't. Corporate credit and equities should be taught in the same class. They should be the same part of the CFA exam. They should be taught in the same books, because the underlying are the financials. Why corporate credit is taught in the same room as municipal debt makes no sense. Muni debt has a totally different base, taxpayer, whatever else. But corporate credit and credit default swaps and whatever should be taught in the same class, in the same room with the same research people as the equity people because it's the same company, isn't it? Isn't it? And because it isn't, it creates a dislocation which allows people like Mitch to make a crazy amount of money because they see things six months, one year, two years before everybody else. You can't be a great equity investor. You can't, including in India, unless you're a solid credit analyst. You don't have to be a credit investor, but a solid credit analyst. And again, you can't rely on the ratings. I think it's a common theme. Yes, you cannot rely on the credit ratings. So this is Barron's. So put these two things together. This is number one and number two, um, these two lessons. So AMD, big chip maker, right, for computers, um, they traded down to $2.50 because of bankruptcy fears. Now those bankruptcy fears, were because they had a cash from operations. As reported, cash flow from operations, negative, I don't know, negative 50 million, 100 million, something like that. 
right? Well, if you have no cash from ops, how are you going to service the debt? You must have bankruptcy concerns. And this is what everyone was reporting. This is what Moody's was saying and everyone else. Um, this is the stock, $2.50 a share. And then they had a credit default swap. Just a credit default swap is the easiest thing to understand. All it is is the cost to swap the default risk of the credit. I own the credit, I own the debt, and I want to pay something so that I don't get hit if the company goes bankrupt. What do I pay? 6.6% .6 a year. CDS contracts are five years, so think about this. This is just this is easy math. That means over the course of five years, to insure my debt, I will pay 40% of my principal. To protect against losing my principal, I have to pay 40% of the principal. So anything above 200, 300, 400 is extremely high because you're giving up all the principal anyway. Yes? What's the point of insuring debt if you're going to spend 40% on the insurance contract anyway? You just gave up 40% of the principal. So anything like 660 is high. So why do we bring this up? Because in reality, this was cash flow from operations on a uniform accounting basis. The actual cash generating ability of AMD was about $1.1 billion that year. $1.1 billion versus negative. That means we can service our debt. Now, why is this the case? Because of FASB. Sorry about this deep accounting stuff. Right? The FASB, this is when I was studying for, for the accounting exam. So this is late 80s. When the cash flow statement was built in late 80s, there were seven FASB members. Seven. Do you know to pass a new accounting rule, you only need a simple majority? Simple majority. So these three guys said, the statement of cash flows is ridiculous. It should not be passed. It is not a statement of cash flows. And the other four said, yeah, but we need something. This is written testimony, by the way. This is actually written in the FASB. They actually said, here's what they said. They said, the statement of cash flows is inconsistent. It doesn't make sense. Operations is not operations. Investing is not investing. Finance is not financing. They said it's misleading. They said it's confusing. This is the late 80s, right? It's inaptly named. They go, it's not a statement of cash flows. It isn't. It's just a reworked income statement. But it's not actually a statement of cash flows. This is three of the seven. Three of the seven. And likely to be misunderstood by most users of the financials to include the credit rating agencies and Wall Street. Wall Street, I mean the investment bankers, not the buy side, right? Sorry, bankers. So this is the statement of cash flows. There's three sections, operations, investing, and financing. Where do you put interest expense? Don't answer, just mentally say. Of these three buckets, when a company finances its debts, they have debt, they finance the debts, what bucket would you put it in? Well, I would say financing. No. But unfortunately, under US GAAP and under Indian GAAP, it goes under operations, even if you're not a bank. If you're a bank, OK, interest expense is part of operations. I'm a bank. That's my job, right? Interest. But if you're a regular company, to put interest under operations, and where do dividends go? A payment to finance through equity. Dividend goes under financing. This is Indian Gap. This is US Gap. It's crazy. It doesn't make any sense. Uh, let's see what else. Um, rental financing. So a company decides to rent. Instead of, uh, instead of buy. Um, or the leases don't get capitalized. That's a, that's a rule, right? It's a choice. The CFO chooses whether the lease gets capitalized when they talk to the asset back lender. Every good asset back lender will say, when you buy this $100 million machine, sorry, when you rent it, do you want it to be capitalized or not? And they know this four-way test that they learn from the accountants, and then they decide. And it goes on the books or not. Well, if it goes on the books, that rent flows through operations. If it goes on the books as an asset, it flows through investing. FedEx, Federal Express, and UPS, totally incomparable statements of cash flow. Because FedEx rents and chooses not to capitalize the leases. It's a choice. And UPS doesn't. All of their assets show up on the balance sheet. So the cash from operations number for UPS looks higher than FedEx's because of the rent number. But the asset base of FedEx looks like it's tiny because it's missing 400 planes that UPS has on there. Right? Well, this is a statement of cash flows issue. So it depends on the accounting. Um, current Indian GAAP follows US GAAP. Um, you know, the world, IFRS and US GAAP, is now adopting these new lease financing rules. 
without getting into it, they're also wrong. They took four years to fix this thing, and the accountant screwed it up yet again. I mean, I guess I keep my job that way. Um, and cash flow from acquisitions. Now, thankfully, under Indian Gap, you have this thing that you still can use called pooling of interest. Yes? Under US Gap, outlawed. Under IFRS, outlawed. No more pooling of interest. I will actually tell you pooling of interest is the smart way to do it. Because at the end of the year, you have all the cash flows of the companies, the two, and you have all the debts and all the assets. But under acquisition accounting method, which is required under US GAAP and required under IFRS, under those accounting methods, you count all the debt at the end of the year, all the debt's there, but you only count the cash flows. Cash flows and the income and the revenue of the acquired company from the date of the acquisition. And would you be surprised to know that management teams tend to buy more in the second half of the year than they do in the first half to juice up earnings, right? They make acquisitions in the back end of the year. In fact, more acquisitions happen in the fourth quarter than in any other quarter of the calendar year, fiscal year of the company, of the buyer. So what you have is all this debt and this month cash flow. Missing, missing. How do I do debt analysis? I say, here's the cash I have, here's the debt I have. I do a cash to debt, but my debt number is all my debt, and my cash number is missing nine months or 10 months, or six months, all right? It's horribly off. No one's making this adjustment at the big three, and you don't see it. So anyway, we get back to Barron's, and what happened over the next couple of years was they continued to report negative cash flows while they continued to actually generate positive cash flows because of non-cash stock options, non-cash interest, uh, sorry, uh, non-cash pensions, and a number of other items that said this company really has more than enough to service its debt, and what happened? The stock of 2050 went to today of $48 a share. Good job, Barron's. And the credit default swap of 660, that's very expensive, is now only 60 basis points. 60, that means for 0.6 times five, for the mere cost, 0.6 times five, for the mere cost of 3%, you get AMD's debt at risk-free. Risk-free for the cost of 3% over five years total. That's cheap. That means the credit markets and the equity markets are in total agreement. AMD is a very good, safe company. Stock reflects it, credit reflects it, and the credit ratings still say, this is as of last week, double B minus junk debt, whether we're talking to Moody's or S&P. Ridiculous. So far behind, it's ridiculous. Right? Whether you're a credit investor or an equity investor, it pays off to do both. Is this interesting? Or am I boring? People sleeping? No? All right. Now this is the CFA Society of New York, NYSSA, their 25th annual bond conference. This is late 2015. And they said, we want to look at a presentation like this. And I showed Delta Airlines. This is the actual Moody's report from Delta Airlines, um, where Delta was being given a double B minus. That is junk. That's high yield. That's a good chance of bankruptcy. All right, that is, don't trust this company's debt. Um, and at $10 a share, Delta stock price, all right, with double B minus, had also seen a CDS of 900. So that's real worry. But at the time of this report, the 900 CDS was already on the way to falling to 260. That is the credit market saying, worried about bankruptcy, a lot less worried about bankruptcy. And the stock, all right, Let's see. Oh, and the credit, why? Well, Moody's was still using EBITDA margin. EBITDA. So ITDNA, which all go the right direction for the company. It's a very rosy picture to do EBITDA. That's why bankers like EBITDA. It gets the company to buy whatever they're pitching. It's true. Sorry, bankers. All right, EBIT to interest and another debt to EBITDA ratio. Now, this isn't me, this is Buffett. People who use EBITDA are either trying to con you or they're conning themselves, <laughs> quote, unquote, because it paints too rosy a picture, right? Now, in this case, I don't think Moody's was trying to con you. I think they didn't know any better. I don't think, anyway. So you get this, and of course, what happened? The stock price went up to where it is today, $60 a share. I think we know what happened. The credit did not default. It was investment grade. And the 900 CDS, which fell to 260 today, this is as of today, is a mere 90 basis points per year. That's pretty cheap. Even for an airline, for the cyclicality, that is pretty cheap. Right? The credit markets and equity markets are now in alignment. 
they totally agree. They totally agree. Um, Fitch ratings. This is gaming operators, so I don't want to just pick on Moody's. This is Fitch. This is how they calculate the credit ratings for these companies. EBITDA, EBITDA margin, net to EBITDA, debt to EBITDA, and this phenomenal EBITDA. Because that's going to fix all the problems, right? <laughs> so Benjamin Graham's book, Secure Analysis, is a guy named Seth Klarman. Do you know this name? One of the greatest equity investors of the last 40 years. Right? He wrote in the uh, book. He also published his own book called Margin of Safety, which is impossible to get. Right? If you go to Amazon, it's like $800 or something. The Intelligent Investor, um, I don't know if you know that the chapter, Intelligent Investor, chapter 20, is called Margin of Safety. It was an homage to Ben Graham. He said, I'm just updating what Ben Graham already said. Right? It was an homage to Ben Graham. You're reading basically the same book, but in today's, in today's terms, according to Seth. So Seth Klarman, uh, this is the S&P. This is Seth Klarman's performance. That's alpha. That's massive, massive alpha. And he said, oh, I don't know why all these investors have started using EBITDA. I don't understand it. He goes, EBIT was already a problem. It does not represent cash flows of a company. There's all kinds of other adjustments you have to make other than just interest and taxes. By the way, don't companies pay taxes? How is tax a non-cash item? Um, adding back DNA, doesn't depreciation represent an actual cost of replenishing the asset? Of course it does. And amortization of software certainly does. So it's even less meaningful. Anyway, that's Seth Klarman, right? Don't use EBITDA, don't rely on it. And then finally, S&P's global rating methodology. This is global. Um, EBITDA is mentioned a whopping 57 times, 57 times in the report. And Charlie Munger would say to that, the horrors, the horrors of EBITDA, the horrors of EBITDA have been understated, as has the disgusting nature. He's talking about bankers. Sorry again, bankers. <laughs> right? You see this common theme. Right? As the disgusting nature of the people that brought that term into use. Because he says it paints too rosy a picture and it gets you to buy stuff you shouldn't. And by the way, it's not a proxy for cash flow. It just isn't. So this is a proxy for cash flow. What, of 130 adjustments, there's only five to seven that ever matter. It's just it's a different five to seven from company to company. Not just industry, as you saw with FedEx and UPS, but from company to company. And sometimes it's different from year to year, right? Because companies change accounting policies. It's allowed. It's legal. When's the last time you looked in the notes to see which accounting policies have changed? Because the auditors have to say it. There's nothing wrong with it, but the auditors have to say, they changed an accounting policy. Did you catch it? Who reads that stuff? So I did a program like this in, uh, in um, New York, and a very brave big three agency director stood up, and she said, look, it's not our job to audit the auditors. It's a very good point. She said, it's not our job to audit the auditors. But that is the issue. The auditors are not the problem. The auditors are simply auditing to the rules. The management team is not the problem. I know a lot of people want to pick on the management team, right? But by and large, the management team, don't hate the player, hate the game. The management team is stuck with the accounting rules also. The problem are the rule makers. FASB and the IASB, and also here in India, right, was it the M, M, C, right, are responsible for these rules, and the rules don't make sense. They don't make sense, they're inconsistent, they're distorted. Who's reading this accounting research, so this uniform accounting stuff? Of these top 10 firms, including yours, Satish, right, number four, is that right? Number three, maybe? Four. Number four. four is all right. um, <laughs> Nine of the top 10 are reading the work. I can't tell you which nine, so just guess. Um, nine of the top 10. Of the top 300 money managers on the planet, um, 180, it's actually closer to 200 now, 180 are reading uniform accounting earnings, uniform accounting reports. This is every week, every week. Um, I believe on FactSet, for those FactSet users, single most downloaded research report of any independents that are on there is uniform accounting. Anyway, this is Delta Airlines looking at uniform accounting. So first off, you get a blue line. That is the operating cash flow calculating correctly. That's the real operating cash flow of Delta. This is in 2015. This is when I did that presentation. These are the exact slides. So in fact, it was early 2015, so that was still an estimate. Um, 10 billion in cash flow, another 3 billion of cash on hand. And see that triangle? That's another billion in a revolver, ready to access credit. So the company has 14 billion of cash available, 
and they're going to have to spend it on this debt maturing. That's a known number. This interest expense, known number. The rent number, which you have to decapitalize the leases to get to the true rent number, that you can't pull it right out of the, out of the statement. You get it from the notes. The dividends, R&D, pension servicing costs, not the pension expense. And you end up with this total obligations, cash uses. Is there any chance a company generating 10 billion in cash flow with ready to access 3 billion of cash on hand and another billion in revolver is gonna be insolvent when their total obligations is seven? Is there any chance? There's no chance. There's no way this company, the cushion is so big it's ridiculous. Um, and that continues if we forecast that out because these are known numbers, these, the stack, right, of the next seven years and it only gets better and better and better in terms of the cushion. There is no way Delta Airlines, this is what we saw at the CFA conference in 2015, right? And it would suggest that the investment grade, it's investment grade rating, not the double B minus junk debt that uh, Moody's was placing on it at the time, right? Well, Moody's was looking at the gap numbers. The gap numbers did not reflect economic reality. Um, and the CDS had already fallen at 259, 260, at the time already, but the intrinsic, if you did a regression analysis of this chart, it would say the CDS should be 97. Where is it today? 90. That's today. That's today. But to do it, honestly, the tough part's the accounting. Once you get through the accounting, the number's just up here. It's easy. And it doesn't take a rocket science to do this accounting stuff. It's just tedious. It is just boring. Anyway, is the U.S. recession and bear market coming? Let's see. This is what Deloitte has been publishing, this earning power. Earning power appeared, I think, over 100 times in uh, Ben Graham's books. The importance of earning power, the company's ability to generate earnings. So this is saying that since 1965, the quality of US corporate America has been falling. They're using US gap numbers, by the way. Second, the Schiller Cape Ratio, right, has been paraded around that it's the third highest level right now, the third highest level in history. That's 120 year, 130 year history. So the market's in a bubble. By the way, it's, it's been flashing this for like the last four or five years. At some point you're gonna say, eh, four or five years it's been flashing red. Well, here's the problem. They're using gap earnings. So neither can you trust these numbers if you use gap earnings because the way companies are being calculated for earnings today is not the same as 10 years ago, it's not 20 years ago, it's not as 30 years ago. So you can't do this kind of analysis. It's ridiculous to just pull in the PEs and do this. So you can't trust this. And then Schiller, I mean, he got a Nobel Prize in real estate. He did not get a Nobel Prize in accounting. And so you can't trust this either. He's smiling in a lot of his pictures. It's actually hard to find a picture of him. He's not smiling. Um, smiling, not smiling. Um, this is actual US corporate returns on, I think, 4,000 US companies. And it shows that in 99, 2000, they did have an 8% return. This is everyone, 8% real, it's a real number. Fell to six, well, the return falls by 33%. Um, you're gonna have a or 25 to 33%. Um, your stock price is gonna fall too, valuation. Um, they recovered handily in 2007, collapsed again until today. You are looking at US corporate America at the highest return we've ever measured in 50, 60, 70 years. This is the highest earning power, Ben Graham term. The highest earning power of corporate America ever measured, ever. And compare that against a valuation that was ridiculous at 32 times. I mean, the US wasn't growing at 8% a year, 7% a year. 32 times multiple is crazy. And stock market collapses, all the way down to a 15 times multiple in 2010. So now what is about a median multiple of 21? That's a median on a uniform adjusted basis. So you have a so-so valuation, not too high, not too low, and the highest quality ever. Does that sound like a stock market bubble? I don't think so. No, the S&P 500 has 30% upside from where it is now. From where it is now, the S&P 500 still has 30% upside. And why can we be so confident in saying this? Because the credit. Corporate interest rates are driven by credit default swaps. They are. The credit default swap informs the world as to what the interest rate should be. And so if we look at this back in 04, right, between 300 to 600 and rising into 07, it skyrockets. Two, who's going to pay 2,020% a year? Over five years, that's 100% of your principal. Why, why bother insuring it? 
right? That means uninsurable debt. And thankfully, the crisis was averted. It came down. It had a little bit of a scare in 2011, and then came down again. And today, what does it look like? As safe or safer than this started. Until this number starts rising, until the risk of debt starts rising, right? Because debt always, the credit risk, we can go back 150 years, precedes the equity market collapsing. We know we have a reason to think this. And now we can say, but when could the CDS pop? Well, remember that credit thing we did for a company, for Delta? We can do that for the entire market. So this is for the top, I don't know, 1,500, 2,000 companies in the US. This is the actual, no, it's S&P 1000. S&P 1000, and it says that, believe it or not, in 2019, there is not enough cash flow to cover all the uses. And that top blue bar of uses, you know what that is? Share buybacks. So in 2019, you could already see that there was not enough operating cash flow to continue the share buyback programs. There's enough to cover everything else, though. So we didn't need Goldman Sachs to tell us this. You don't need Goldman to tell you this. You would have known it ahead of time because the cash wasn't there. You just had to do it on a uniform accounting basis, not gap. And so what does this look like over the next couple of years? No risk. We're not going to see the share buybacks again next year. But we don't have a they have more than an easy enough time of paying all their debts, debt service, until, this is 2021, and here we go. That is called a massive debt headwall. You know what that looks like? It looks like 2008. It looks like 1929. It looks like 1938. It looks like 2000. It's companies don't have enough cash to pay their debts, including the cash on hand, which means everyone's gonna have to refi at exactly the same time, which banks do not like doing, which means there won't be enough refi available, which means unless this chart changes, we've got two more good years of the bull market before things really go belly up. Now, is it possible things change? We'll see. We have an election next year. We, have, we can see if companies are able to refi another five years out. It's possible. It's possible. But when the bad things happen, and by the way, it only gets worse the year after. There is not enough cash to even cover maintenance capex, let alone share buybacks, you're going to have some serious issues five, four, five, three, five years from now. Anyway, so that says next two years at least, the S&P continues to rise on a multiple that's actually quite calm on a phenomenal earnings quality number that uh, is kicking. So um, this Uniform Investing Genius, we take Seth Klarman and a bunch of portfolios, and we actually show you their portfolios on Uniform. Because when you look at our gap, it looks like Seth Klarman is buying crazy stocks. On Uniform, it looks like he's buying very sensible, high quality, low valuation items. So if you're interested, just all right, hit me there. Um, this is Indian companies. This is the database as of this past week. Um, it starts with Reliance and Tata and Unilever. Um, this is Reliance Industries. It would show a return on assets. This is, go online. This is the return on assets you'll see based on India gap, Indian gap, and it would say the return on assets is falling. In fact, it fell a lot worse. This is in a 2017. The blue numbers got lower than the orange. It got worse than even the as reported. However, this is the good news, in the last two years, not only has it recovered, the current earnings number is of an even higher quality than what the US gap. It doesn't always go one direction, right? In this case, the earnings quality went from even worse than what the US GAAP was reporting to even better. That's Reliance. Um, and the PE, and this is for those of you investing, individual investors, the PE of 17 times, is that right? For Reliance right now? 17 times? In reality, it's about 23. It's not as cheap as you think it is. Not our uniform numbers. It's not as cheap. It's a higher quality firm, but not as cheap as you think. Um, if I look at their credit cash flow prime, Enough cash to cover all their obligations, plus a massive amount of cash on hand. That deserves an investment gate rating. There's no credit default swap to look at, but I can look at an ICDS. The intrinsic CDS says if we regress this against the rest of the world, they'd have a CDS of 20. That's investment grade. This is Repro. Looks like, now why would Repro stock? This has not been a bad stock for the last 20 years. The return is falling every year. In reality, they actually are generating more than double the return that shows more than double with a PE that looks like it's 14 times. Anyone own this stock? In reality, what is it? 14 times. It's as cheap as it looks under uniform numbers, but much, much higher quality. 
That's an interesting name for that reason alone, for that reason alone, for Wipro. Um, and obviously, Wipro doesn't have any credit issues. Phenomenal looking credit cash flow chart. 412 Indian non-financials. We're going to take the banks separately, right? How do they look? They peaked returns in 2006 and 07, collapsed into 2014, popped 2015, fell into 2017. And the good news is improving handily the last two years. In fact, uniform earnings, meaning true earnings, has been accelerating for India companies at such a pace that even though the market has right, held up well, the PE is as cheap as it's been in 11, 12 years. Very interesting. That is a very bullish signal. Very positive returns, improving on a uniform basis, and a PE that's only 23 times right, versus where it's been. I mean, that's fantastic. It's great. Um, it's very bullish. Oh, and in aggregate, the debt issues, we don't see it in India the way we see it in the US, meaning no problems. No debt headwalls the way we have in the United States in two years. In two years, the US is going to get tough. If they don't do some massive refinancing in the next 24 months, the US is going to get a lot of trouble. Um, but we don't see that issue here. So very safe credit, low multiples, super high quality and improving returns. It's very bullish for the India stock market. But it goes back to this. Shall I sit? Yes, Satish? please. Is it OK? Yes. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Joe. That Thank was uh, excellent, interesting, <laughs> entertaining. Spicy enough for uh, post-lunch. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so you have uh, an upside of 30% on the S&P. Uh, what could go wrong in that uh, scenario? Um, any episodic issues that could happen that could create trouble or? Uh, the election. So you know, right now, um, I'm not a political analyst. But the fact is, in the United States, um, the US tends to not, uh, they tend to reelect the president if you have low unemployment, low un inflation, a strong stock market, a solid economy, and we are more than likely to see that going into the next you know, three quarters. So assuming Trump gets reelected and follows with the same economic policies, meaning corporate tax rates stay low, capital gains and dividends tax rates stay where they are. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no reason not to see the S&P go up 30 plus percent. Um, what could affect that? Um, if for whatever reason, uh, two or three of the top candidates who are running right now um, on the opposing side, uh, the Democrats, have talked about raising capital gains, raising dividends tax rates, getting rid of the corporate tax cut that we have in place. And the fact is, those three things combined, no amount of increase in corporate earnings right. can make up for the devaluation that will happen from increasing those three taxes in that way. And so if, if that is the case, I will have to change my tune uh, a year from now. Cool. Um, you've um, talked a lot about the US. Would, what's your views on Europe? Uh, are they in the same boat as uh, with improving uh, fundamentals or improving uh, uh, credit? In, uh, and, and maybe that's a better opportunity from valuation perspective? Um, well, I mean, S&P of 30% upside, I still like. Yeah, I, can, well, I can't complain. Yeah. Um, in Europe, I think it's a bit country by country. I mean, you, you still have the, uh, you know, the pigs issue of Portugal, Italy, Greece, and Spain. You still have some serious banking issues. Um, that's a Goldman term, pigs, right? That's not my term. Um, that's, uh, uh, you still have some serious issues in those countries and those markets that, that I think I'd be um, concern about, but overall things have been improving, but they were late to the game. They were late to put in quantitative easing um, coming out of 2008, 2009. Uh, they put in austerity rules, and I'd argue exactly the wrong time. You put in austerity rules when things are good, not when things are bad. So if the government stops spending at the same time the private sector is not spending, you end up delaying this, this uh, bear market, which is what we saw. So I think things are improving, but um, I'd still favor Overall, I'd still favor the US and, and I'd say probably India in terms of markets or regions to be investing in equity-wise. Right. Okay. Um, I have a question from, um, from online. Um, the question is, which of the few stocks that look deceivingly good at this moment? 
<laughs> I, I guess you could use a global uh, <laughs> perspective um, on that. <laughs> there's a lot of microcaps I don't like. <laughs> um, you know, it's it's uh, but but you know, it's hard to be short anything if you have a call that the market's going to be up 30 percent because the fact is it lifts all boats. Right. So. Um, there might be some sectors or industries that might underperform, but the fact is if everything goes up, everything goes up, uh, and so it's, it's difficult to find, to find that kind of an issue. Um, even in China, I think, I, I wish I could say there's more ugly stocks to mention around the world, but even in China, when you look at uh, Baba, and you look at uh, C-Trip, and you look at um, Baidu, uh, and of course Tencent, Mm -hmm. These stocks are trading very inexpensively yeah. relative to their cash flow generating ability. Um, that's not a surprise, but it shows up on uniform also. And so over the course, it's, it's, I'm far more long and we're far more long on ideas. Right. There's a lot more good stuff in there in the world that looks bad than there's bad stuff that looks good. Um, good. Two years from now, that'll change, right. particularly in the United States. That'll change. Um, you know, I've been in the markets now for a while, and, and even when I started my career, we were always mining the rating agencies, mm. meaning we'd, we'd look at what the ratings were given by the rating agencies, and then we'd do our analysis and wait for them to upgrade so we got our price uptick. And that hasn't changed. Yeah. Um, and you're kind of negative on the rating agencies being a little slow. Corporate credit rating agencies. Yes, even, yes. even otherwise, right? Mm -hmm. even, even on mortgage sites, uh, they were a little late on, uh, in the game. Um, why do you think that the rating agencies behave the way they are? I mean, obviously, they know they are a little slow. Um, is, is there some institutional stuff that's going on, that's why they're not catching up with the, with the markets? So in, in earlier, the first half of 2008, um, the CFA Institute had me do a program in New York uh, on something similar. And I showed credit default swaps for 1,200 companies globally, 1,200 companies, and we showed the credit rating. Right. And there should be a parallel, there should be a relationship, meaning poorly rated credit should have a very high CDS, and very high rated credit should have a very low CDS. Um, spurious, and there's no R squared even. It was a mess. If you run that analysis today, right. you see a surprising correlation between CDS and credit ratings that will astound you. And so you can sit here and say, so does that mean that suddenly the credit markets pay so much attention to the credit rating? Or is it the opposite, which you can actually show mathematically, that credit ratings today are simply moving towards the CDS peg? They're looking where the CDS is, and they're following it, which means, OK, the rating is, I don't know if you want to say more reliable. It's more accurate, but it'll still be late because it's still an average of where the CDS happens to be. The CDS is still going to move before the credit rating, both good and bad, uh, and I think even more so today than back in 2008. Right. So they, they fixed their business in a, in a funny way. The ratings are more accurate. They're just absolutely more laggard than before. Right. Okay, there's a bunch of questions here which are kind of related. Um, it's related to the FANG stocks. Um, the market rally is driven by a few stocks in, you know, in the U.S. And, and the, here they are alluding to the FANG stocks. Um, you think the cash flows and valuations there are, are kind of positive for this momentum to continue in FANG stocks? Yeah, when, when you look at the accounting issues, right. the accounting issues um, and accounting policies in general are so far behind on the tech industry and the new economy that the earnings just don't reflect reality. And so across all of them, whether it's Facebook or Alphabet or Netflix, right. the, the accounting earnings and the return on assets according to gap numbers is, is not only lower, it's multiples lower than the uniform cleaned up consistently calculated number. So um, they have gotten expensive and like the Amazon mm -hmm. uh, example, rightly so. I mean, Netflix I mean, has been showing a, a, a close to zero return on assets on any major database for the last like 15, uh, 12 years. Um, on a uniform basis, it literally is off the charts. It's off the charts in terms of measurements. So they all are doing very well because they are crushing it from a right. earning power standpoint. They're doing fantastic, um, Apple included, Apple included. And the, Earnings and accounting numbers today just don't pick it up. 
Right. So the distortions you see there are much bigger, um, and in fact, much more positive. So the valuations have gotten high, and deservedly so. Right. Um, we've had a credit bubble in the last year. I mean, mm. credit markets have done really well. Spreads have compressed. Um, you know, uh, how, how do you see that playing out over the, this year? And well, at some point, people give up and they start buying equities, right? <laughs> at some point, yeah. and so I think it'll. Uh, it's, it's money on the sidelines that's ready to go into, still to go into equity markets. That's, that's dry powder for that 30% kind of run that I talked about and a very bullish uh, market in, uh, in India and some other locations as well. Um, the, uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. No, um, that, that's interesting because we are always looking at where the fresh money is going to come in if you're thinking about 30% upside. In, in S and P, especially given credits being yeah. very strong. Six too. countries of right. negative rates at this point. Eight countries of negative yeah. rates. I mean, how can you leave your money in, in debt? Well, the, the stock market did 28 percent last year, right? Mm. I mean, it's it's crazy. Oh, and most of these negative uh, rates are now being normalized towards zero. What's your take on? Is you think that's going to happen, or we? I mean, at some point we have to go back to some. You think we state. should go back to, you know, or will it stay negative for? Well, there, yeah. there's some economists that I would argue that, um, that on a real basis, rates are more often negative than you think. Right. It's they're negative nominally right now, but if you took inflation into consideration, you actually get negative rates, negative real rates, more often than people would say. So I don't want to say it's totally abnormal if you look at real rates as opposed to nominal only, um, and particularly when you have many countries that might actually be in a deflationary or a zero inflation environment. Um, it's not crazy for this to last a bit longer, and it could be a couple more years they have these really, really low rates. Um, when things go bad is when we see things like the corporate uh, credit head wall that we see in uh, a couple of years in the US um, and possibly in other countries, because that will create a financial contagion. Um, I know you don't follow India very closely, uh, but you hear what are your views uh, on the markets here, general views on uh, the stocks that you may have observed? I mean, the, the, the stock market has held up fairly well given the problems and issues over the last couple of years and the, the, the bank issues that we talked about, right? right? Um, but uh, overall, when, you know, we have to look at the market as a whole and the analysis we showed is over 400 Indian companies, all restated back to a uniform basis. And it would say that the quality of earnings um, and the, uh, the earning power is improving radically over the last you know, two years, um, while the multiple is actually somewhat muted. That's a good thing. Yeah. That's a good thing going forward, across the board anyway. Right. Right. Yeah. All right. Um, I think, um, any last words before we end this session? No, this is great. Thank All you right. so much. Thanks, Thank everyone. You, Thanks Thank for the you, time. Thank you, everybody. For, uh, <laughs>